We're speaking with Jeffrey Wiesenfeld here in New York the week after the resounding successful Stop Iran rally uh, in Times Square, and um, he helped put it together and and, uh, and hosted it. And it, it seems like it came out of nowhere, and now it's a, a phenomenon. How did it get started? There are a group of us that first came together, a core of six or seven of us. Each of us have our own lives to lead, our own jobs. Uh, we know each other from various Jewish functions, communal functions. Uh, we've seen each other around. We first coalesced around the issue of the uh, presentation of Klinghoffer, the opera, the Metropolitan Opera. And uh, it seemed pretty outrageous to us. It was, uh, it was more than just uh, something that, uh, that, that one could say is uh, some kind of attempt at balance, but in reality what it was, it was a calumny against the Jewish people. And since it receives government support, the opera, and since so many patrons of the opera, donors, are so active in the Jewish community, we felt they had to really understand how people at large felt about it. It was a very successful undertaking. And then we went our way, our separate ways. But as this issue began to develop, and it appeared that the White House was getting close to a deal, and with each passing week, the details of the deal were becoming more and more egregious, we took together this core group once again and built from that mm -hmm. and started to get private donations mm -hmm. through a 501c3. And we were able to get experts on our group who were, some were experts in social media, some in negotiating for, for advertising space, others in getting the, the equipment needed to conduct a rally stage, sound and so forth. And we moved forward. Mm -hmm. Why didn't this emanate from the uh, Jewish Federation or somewhere within the uh, existing mainstream Jewish organization? Believe it or not, that starts over a century ago. The answer to that? Yes. The, the, the simplest condensation of that is that back in the days when Jews were in the Pale of Settlement and in Eastern Europe more generally, they were subject to pogroms, persecution, which has been our Jewish lot for 2,000 years. But then came these perceived panaceas, Buddhism, socialism, communism, and they felt that this would be the salvation to their wounds. Unfortunately, while the pogroms were still going on, many of these people who came here, I call them the Mayflower Jews, mm -hmm. the Jews of the big waves, the late 1890s, the early 1900s, they came here and they took these egalitarian approaches with them, liberalism, which eventually became their complete and utter allegiance to one party here in the United States. Mm -hmm. They didn't stay in Europe long enough to see that the theories that they advanced here, which had some validity at a time uh -huh. for the labor movement, for women's rights, and yeah. so on. Under the czar. Right. But, they, but here, you did need labor rights. We saw that with the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire mm -hmm. and so forth. But those Jews who were left behind they lived to see, unfortunately, that socialism, communism, and the rest were no better than the czars who persecuted mm -hmm. the immigrants mm -hmm. who came earlier. But this liberalism became a part of their internal, it was internalized by them. Mm -hmm. And it translated into allegiance for one political party. And then in the 1950s, you saw the Jews come here, like my parents and my wife's parents, survivors of the Holocaust, most of whom have a very different view of the world. They know that the conditions which the leftists, the liberals, thought would be their salvation was not. Communism was little better than totalitarianism mm -hmm. and the Nazism which preceded it. And so they came here with a completely different attitude. Now, the, the result is that by the 1950s, late 50s, early 60s, the conservative and reform movements of Judaism, and I'm not commenting in any way how observant or non-observant someone is, that's none of my business. What I do is not their business, what they do is not my business. But those two movements, seeing the emptiness of their pews, established this alternative religion called tikkun olam. 
Now, they will say that we're commanded to repair the world. It's an exaggeration. It's nonsense. You read the Siddur, if you pray every day or on the Sabbath, Tikkun Alam says, the exact translation, repair the world by declaring and spreading God's sovereignty. Mm -hmm. doesn't talk about Palestinian rights, mm -hmm. whale rights, gay rights, abortion rights, some of which are very valid things. has nothing to do with scriptural Tikkun Alam. Mm -hmm. But it became an alternative religion. And over time, with the growth of groups like Amenu, Rabbis for Peace, Labor Zionists, and ultimately really nefarious organizations like J Street, it became the alternative religion. But it, it morphed into something that really meant to kun alum a better world for everyone else, but not the Jews. Not because they wanted to hurt Jews on purpose, but they just didn't care. They care about everybody else. Mm -hmm. We became a disreputable people who, who are the only people who don't demand reciprocity for the good that we do for others. We have two-thirds of Jews doing good for everyone else with no concern of what's good for us, for Israel, or Jewish life as a whole. And so that's the, the long story condensed into why it is this way, why Jews behave irrationally. And so since the umbrella Jewish organizations, by definition, have acquired or developed with a larger and larger coterie mm -hmm. of Jews of this faux Tikkun alum fetish, they're unable to react on our collective behalf. Because if they do, they'll not reach consensus. They'll have civil war in their ranks. They'll affect donations. And this is the weakness of organized Jewry. And so when we came together in ragtag fashion, amateurs who do other things to make a living, it resonated with the public. They see that here it is. Everyone has to consider. And, and what do they say? You know, last night I was at a reception for the retirement of Bob Sugarman, who was immediate past president of the Conference of Presidents. Conference of Presidents gets many good leaders every two years as a new, there's a new president of the presidents. Mm -hmm. And they're dedicated to the welfare of, of the uh, Jewish people in the United States. As you know, the Conference of Presidents is our liaison to the government, to the White House, to, di to the diplomatic corps. They mean well. But, and Bob Sugarman is personally a remarkable guy. He's done great things uh, across the spectrum in his uh, legal practice as well for orthodox conservative reform. But he spoke about the importance of civility in Jewish discourse because what happens now is some Jews cannot abide by the fact that for the sake of, of performing tikkun olam and not seeking reciprocity, and frankly we're taken advantage of as Jews, that the vociferous desire to defend Jewish rights, Jewish dignity, and Jewish physical well-being. Unfortunately, when you have people from J Street and organizations that are lying to the public, that are funded by nefarious groups, individuals that are funding organizations that seek to damage our sovereignty in Israel, that seek to undermine us, it's very difficult to be civil with such people. Civility is a very desirable goal. But when someone is really trying to hurt you, there's a reason divorces happen. Sometimes a marriage doesn't work out. And not all divorces are civil. We would like these people to understand that there's a higher goal than civility, and there's a higher goal than working for everyone else without reciprocity. Charity does begin at home. Mm -hmm. That's where the difficulty comes in. The need for consensus with a substantial body of the Jewish people that have drifted into matters that are not necessarily Jewish, except by their own warped definition. 